Hi, round four from the uh, Sahar uh, chess tournament. This game is between a grandmaster, uh, Wang, with the white pieces versus a fide master uh, with the black pieces named uh, Sadawani. Uh, he was rated 2218. GM Wang is rated 2683. And this game is a miniature, ladies and gentlemen. Game started out with C4, English opening. Knight of six. Knight c3, g6, d4. So now we're going to um, either Grunfeld or uh, King's Indian defense. Bishop g7, e4. There it is, King's Indian defense, d6. So now what variation are we going into? There it is, f3, the Zamish variation, which is uh, a solid variation and uh, pretty popular with... Uh, Amateur players also. I know I like this variation also because it's very simple. The basic attacking plans with the bishop going to e3, queen going to d2, pawns going to g4 and h4. All right, bishop, the light square bishop going to d3, the other knight going to e2. A lot of arrows, right? queenside castling because this is like a bundle package it's very very simple and straightforward plan so a lot of uh, beginning players uh you know ad adopt this opening against the king's indian defense uh, with um you know vicious uh king side uh, attack of course black has antidotes to this and so you don't see it too much you usually see the classical variation of the king's indian defense from white usually with knight f3 and so forth and with the uh attack on the uh, queen side rather than attacking on the king side <clears throat> so f3 castle bishop e3 and now c5 and now there's different um many different lines that can be played here d5 um is D you know D five D takes C five can be played. Alright, many different uh things have been tried. Okay, but in this game D takes C five and this is a, a, a basically uh a, a pawn sacrifice from black. Okay, so he avoids the uh brutal attack on the king side from white and opts for an end game where he's a pawn down, but he hopes to um, exhibit a lot of pressure on these dark squares. And he's hoping that by putting a lot of pressure on white's position, because if you notice white is uh, behind in development, that the pawn will basically fall into his lap, so to speak. Because usually what happens uh, is that Opponent will sacrifice a pawn, and then in order to keep the pawn, uh, sometimes a player might put itself into a positional bind. So where he's holding on to the material, but his pieces are bad, right? And then he winds up uh, weakening his position such that the material basically falls into the opponent's hands anyway that he was so earnestly trying to hold on to. So... That's option one. The other option is that the player will just give the pawn back in a timely manner, but the player that sacrificed the pawn um, might have equality, but sometimes he'll get the pawn back, but his pos his position will be bad. It's kind of like you know you're playing like these tricks where you say, okay, I'll give you I'll give you the pawn back, but I'm gonna have a better uh, position here. So let's take a look, see what happens. So right now, white is up a pawn. Knight c6, and this is all theory. This is this is a very old line here. Uh, so bishop e3 is played here. So he just goes right back. Now, one of the old lines, because I remember seeing this back like a long, like in the 90s. Um, I forgot, I think it was like a game between, Gel, like, Gelf, Gelfand was black. I remember that. But anyway, 
just to give you just a quick so after bishop e3 uh c5 d takes c5 one of the this this line was kind of like looked looked down upon for black because after d takes c5 after this move white instead of trading off the queens white would play this move e5 right hitting the knight first and then uh after e5 the knight would jump go back to knight uh knight d7 let me just get myself together here right with this attack on the pawn but then f4 would come then of course f6 so you have this tremendous battle taking place with the dark squares then e takes f6 e takes f6 so here we have it white has given back the pawn right if you want to look at it that way or or we can say black has um recovered the pawn you know however you like to look at it but after bishop e2 knight c6 knight of 3 rook e8 Bishop f2, knight b6. Slowly but surely, white comes out with the better position. Queen takes. Knight takes. There goes the pawn, bishop c4. Knight takes c4, exploiting this pin. And castle exclamation mark. Bishop e6. I know it's a long line. Knight d4. Bishop f7. Knight d to b5. Rook c8. Bishop takes c4. Rook takes c5. Bishop takes f7 check. Knight takes f7 and then rook d7. And white just had this superior position, this constant pressure in the position. And so this line was kind of, um, matter of fact, the game is Portish Gelfand. Uh, Linares, 1990. He actually drew that game, but he had, you know, great difficulties. Great difficulties in the game. So the, the variation, the E5, you know, good variation for white. But um, much water has passed under the bridge since then. And so after c5, d takes c5, d takes c5, Wang just simply traded queens. Queen takes d8, rook takes d8, and he's up a pawn. After bishop takes c5, knight c6, the bishop just hops back. And of course, other moves have been tried. Bishop coming to a3. Uh, for example, but he played bishop e3, b6, rook c1. And the idea is to protect this knight because black plans on, excuse me, white just plans on playing b3, supporting this pawn. So there's the attack on the, the c pawn. Knight h3, not blocking this square so that this pawn is still protected. Knight f2, e6, keeping the knight out of that square, bishop e2, and knight b4. So, there's some pressure here, and um, what I like about White's position already is that he's holding on to the pawn, but he's he's done nothing... Um, to jeopardize his position. He's just played normal developing moves. Right? All the pieces are basically where they would be going anyway. So, um, Black has to um, work on this opening because he sacrificed the pawn, but Black, but White has not, um, 
you know, made his position awkward in any kind of way. It's basically he's just up a pawn. And you really can't do that against the um, Grandmaster. So let's see what Black does to try to, you know, to rectify that situation. So, in other words, what I'm saying is Black has no compensation for the, the pawn deficit. Because White's pieces are good, he's developed. I mean, it's hard to say, you know, point out that, okay, Black has sacrificed the pawn and now he has X, Y, Z. You know, we could say, yes, he fully developed, etc., but White is developed also. So it's not really uh, an advantage here. So um, we could say that black is just a full pawn down for nothing at this point. So we have to search for improvements earlier in the opening. So b3, knight d7. And the idea is real primitive. How am I going to get the pawn back? Well, get rid of this guy and then take with the knight. Castles. Bishop takes c3, rook takes c3, and knight takes a2. So, okay, great. Black has gotten his pawn back, and everything uh, is equal uh, numerically. However, this is and this is what happens many times after an opponent sacrifices a pawn, right? He gets desperate, and he uh, compromises his own position to get the pawn back. So now he's established material equality, but now his position is in jeopardy and now we see that white has the bishop here and what's real dangerous about the position is that white has the dark square bishop and the dark squares are very weak around the king right all those pawns on white squares that lets me know all the dark squares are weak how do we put how how is black going to protect that there's no there's no legitimate way to protect that except putting your king on g7 which makes your king vulnerable to bishop on d4 you know in other words if you put your king on g7 there's no way to keep it there for any decent amount of time so to me black is uh strategically uh very close to being lost here this dark square bishop is very dominant the light square bishop is is, is not too good right now so it's trapped behind these pawns but the key feature is this dark square bishop. Okay. The other key feature in this position is this D file. Right. If white gets control of the D file. And along with this dark square bishop. Then it's going to be a rough day uh, for black. So let's see what happened. This rook is attacked here. Okay. Rook C2. Attacking the um, knight. The knight goes back. And we see who made uh, made better um who had the better of that little um sword fight okay the rook ends up right on d2 in perfect harmony uh so that the other rook can support it on the d file the other knight comes in and now look who has the d file so either Black has to exchange and give up the D file, or he just has to move his rook and give up the D file. So either way, he's giving up the D file. Okay. White has done a great job. He controls the center, right? The only square that's really not uh, under control is the E5 square, but Black doesn't control it either. Okay. The D4 square, excuse me, D5 square is just um, basically you know, under contest by both sides. E E4 is occupied by white. And D4 is occupied, excuse me, controlled by white. Okay. So Black's, Black's uh, strategy has failed. What was Black's strategy? If you understand the King's Indian, you know that the main strategy, along with the, uh, you know, Dragon, Sicilian, uh, Pyrrhic Defense, those type of defenses, even, um, I can't put the uh, modern defense in there, really. But, the control of dark squares, okay, usually starts out with moves like C5, uh, especially in the Sicilian, you know, but some lines of Benoni also with, with the C5, and um, eventually you, play, you try to get the E5 in, you have your bishop here, okay, 
He starts off trying to control the dark squares. And then, of course, once he gains control of the dark squares, he's going to try to tear down the opponent's control over the light squares. But anyway, that has failed. Black the, Black's strategy has failed. The dark square bishop is gone. And white has control over the dark squares. And the light squares. So, and even though the uh, material is equal, trust me, black is in deep trouble here. So now he's forced to give up the file. Okay, so now, <clears throat> and I'm always talking about in my videos too, especially um, in the end game, is you don't want to move without an objective, right? Your go in other words, a goal. Okay, you got to look at this position and say, well, what is what is the you know weakest spot in the position? Because that's where you want to attack. You want to find out what is the weakest, uh, most, uh, you know, tender spot. What's, uh, what's my strong, what's my strongest asset in this position, and what's my opponent's weakest? And you want to try to combine that and form, you know, and and come up with a goal around that. And then once you get the goal, then you make a plan on how to get it. And then while you're making the plan, that's when you um go go over the tactical aspect. You know, to make sure that the moves that you do to implement that plan are sound. And when I look at this position, I see, okay, white has a D file. Of course, you would like to penetrate here, but right now you can't really do that. You have this knight here. Now, let's take the arrow away. So, of course, you can say, okay, well, let's remove the knight. Bishop takes C5 and then penetrate with the rook. Now, that's possible. However, I just told you, this bishop is probably the most valuable piece on the board because it's the only piece that's covering all the dark squares. So you don't want to do that. Okay. But these are things you want to think of. Okay. Um, so I look at this position. These pieces are kind of like irrelevant in a way. They're a little out of, out of things out of, you know, this knight on C5 is not too bad, but this bishop is kind of out of it. But when I look at this position, I want to try to exploit this big weakness over here with these dark squares, right? This to me seems like black's biggest weakness, and I think my biggest strength is this bishop on e3, right? So either I want to have my bishop here, you know, d4, right, contesting the dark squares, or I want my bishop here. But I want my bishop around these squares, Okay, so that would be like my goal to try to exploit this dark square complex somehow. Now my plan will be, okay, let's get this knight involved. Sorry about that. You know, and somehow combine with this bishop on these squares. Okay. Now I will go to the tactical aspect aspect you know what can what would I do first you know can I create like an immediate immediate threat here that, that's the position sorry okay now I see this and this so the first thing that lights up in my mind is knight g4 and f6 check so you see how the tactics line up with the plan Right, it's not just a random fork that you're looking for, but the fork just happens to be be there, right? And it happens to be uh, lined up with your the plans that you want to um, implement concerning the dark squares, right? So I would play like me. I would play knight g4. I would go. I would go for this move because it lines up with everything. And this is my worst place piece. Actually, this bishop is, but you really can't do nothing with this bishop right now. Okay? But the knight can contribute. So, Wang played knight g4. King g7. This is just a desperate move because you really can't stay there. How are you going to stay there? Remember I was saying that earlier in the game? That the really only way to defend the dark squares is to put the king on g7. But... So he stops the, this immediate, excuse me, he stops the immediate threat of that. But what about this? Wang plays bishop h6 check. Back up. 
All right, that's pretty much the only move. And you see how everything is coming together, the exploitation of the dark squares. And you see how the material just drops into White's hands. Because the rook is being attacked, but guess what? The rook has nowhere to go. Your D file is covered, right? You can see that. The F file is covered by the bishop. And this knight is covering these two squares. You see how easy that was? This guy with the black pieces is rated 2200. That's a strong player. And G GM Wang just played real simple, simple moves. Nothing, nothing magical here. Right, I guess that's the mark of a strong player is to make it look easy. Knight C6, right? What else? This this guy again, he couldn't he couldn't even save it. Knight takes. Okay. And again, you reassess the position again. All right, you have your goal like you've, you know, you got this guy here and now I'm looking to penetrate into the position with the rooks. What's holding me up? This guy right here. So I would be thinking, the move I would be thinking is B4. Right? Now, I know he can, I know he can take, but you have to work that out tactically. You see? You have to try, you have to try to work it out tactically to see what, what goes on here. Now, he played B4. Right? Now, let's first, let's first analyze what happens if takes. Now, Let's look at it. Look at the knight. The knight is covering this square also. So we can see that if knight takes, well, we just go to rook d8. Okay. So that's a wrap. How do you defend that? There's no... So... So what happens is he realizes, hey, I can't move this guy. Now, this guy moves, but now you have the uh, seventh rank open. And this and this uh, sixth rank, of course. So he attacks the knight. And this is just, uh, you know, basically tantamount to resigning. So you just give up the rook for two pieces. And you just up a piece. And um, Sadawani resigned. And that was it. All right. So I hope you enjoyed that video. I hope it was instructive. And uh, I'll see you on the next video. Please like and subscribe.